In this session, we will discuss international assignments and expatriation. The session is based on chapter 13 of my book on human resource management, a global and critical perspective, which has been written by this specific chapter has been written by myself and my colleague at the University of Huddersfield, uh, Dr. Andrew Jenkins. So in terms of what we are hoping to cover in this session, we would start with the discussion of two news items, uh, which uh, one is to, from 2015 and the other news item is from 2020 and both news items, they refer to the increasing global demand for healthcare workers. Then we will very briefly touch upon the opening case study which discusses global mobility, mobility and the contextual or situational issues which global mobility and international assignments may face. We would be discussing some basic concepts and definitions such as types of international firms, uh, Perlmutter's model of international orientation. We would also be looking at expatriate selection, adjustment, expatriate competencies and success. And finally, we would also uh, touch upon the notion of repatriation and the associated issues and challenges linked with repatriation. Uh, in the chapter, uh, there is also an end of chapter case study on Chinese experts in India. So let's start the news item. <clears throat> in 2015, in UCSF News, this item uh, appeared, which talks about global shortage of uh, healthcare workers, and that was particularly relevant in the context of, for example, 2004 uh, Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami, 2010 Haiti earthquake, and 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa. So these incidents uh, did highlight the need for well-trained and skilled healthcare workers across the world. A WHO report in 2013, it uh, specified that uh, this was a global issue, the shortage of uh, healthcare workers, doctors, medical and paramedical staff. Uh, and the uh, WHO specified that this shortage was to the tune of 7.2 uh, million, uh, which was double the figure of the requirement in 2007. Uh, actually, more than 70% of that deficit is in developing uh, resource poor countries in Asia and Africa. Uh, that is notwithstanding the fact that there is also an element of <clears throat> brain drain when we see that uh, many doctors from these resource poor locations they are migrating uh, from these countries to more developed countries and industrialized countries in the West. So this was a news item from 2015. If we go to relatively more recent uh, media coverage of global healthcare workers shortage we can look at uh, this CNN article which appeared on 30th of, 30th of March 2020. And in this specific article, uh, CNN reports <coughs> that the US government uh, is uh, taking actions uh, in order to address the gap of healthcare workers and part of that action is also to perhaps relay, relax the barriers or restrictions on providing uh, work visas or immigration visas to healthcare professionals. So for example, the US State Department and it updated its guidelines to encourage foreign medical professionals uh, with approved visa petitions to request visa appointments even as all U.S. embassies and consulates uh, were, had suspended their routine visa services, 
And bear in mind that this is in the context of the coronavirus. So we are talking about March 2020 or April 2020, where uh, there was lockdown in many states in the US and also in many countries in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, but uh, this whole scenario, this whole uh, contextual evolution of the COVID-19 outbreak, it necessitated the U.S. government and many other governments uh, to revisit their visa regulations and other immigration regulations in order to facilitate the hiring and early induction of medical staff. Okay, with this we can go to the uh, opening case study. Uh, this opening case study which talks about the radical side of this chapter. International assignments, as we know, they are now a key part of human resource management in our current globalized village uh, where we are more than ever interconnected uh, through various channels of uh, communication and commutation. Surely employees as well as organizations, uh, they can draw benefit from the opportunities of international expatriation and experience. Um, uh, the whole notion and the field of international assignment has evolved in the past four or five decades uh, thanks to advances in, as I said, uh, transportation and communication technologies. So there are a range of options which are currently available to organizations in terms of their orientation to uh, globalization. So let's quickly look at the types of international firms. So these are uh, three types which are usually referred to in the literature. The first two types are somewhat overlapping, uh, which is MNEs and MNCs, which is multinational enterprise and multinational corporation. A multinational enterprise is a company headquartered in one specific country, but it has operations in many other countries. Whereas an MNC is a firm uh, that operates in two or more countries uh, and in operations across different countries, it offers uh, some kind of independence. In contrast to the first two types, a transnational corporation or a TNC um, is involved with international production of goods or services, foreign investments or income and assets. So this means that it's not necessarily uh, producing uh, goods or offering services in one specific country. In a way, it can be assumed that it would be headquartered in more than one country in terms of the establishment and the functioning of its operations. So once again, uh, the theoretical explanation of different international orientations which organizations can adopt, uh, we can refer to Perlmutter's model. And Perlmutter uh, introduced the EPG model as an international business approach to illustrate three orientations of organizations or managers that either they can be ethnocentric or polycentric or geocentric. Uh, Perlmutter's uh, typology has been used by many scholars uh, subsequently, for example, Ruckman and Collins in 2012. They also developed the same typology in order to uh, classify organizations. So at this ethnocentric are those organizations which are dominated by managers from the parent country. So there is an element of ethnocentrism that the organization and the organizational leaders, they only apparently trust. Uh, the parent country. So those uh, who would be appointed as managers, they would necessarily be from the parent country and, and the parent company. Polycentric are those organizations which uh, serve or which act like a federation of semi-autonomous organizations. Of course, there would be reporting structures but there would be also delegation of business activities to subsidiaries. So instead of one specific center, we are talking about many or poly centers. And geocentric is more uh, global and international in its orientation. 
because such firms are more collaborative in that the headquarters and subsidiaries, they share power and responsibility. So there is a greater deal of autonomy and delegation in geocentric firms with promotions being based on ability rather than, rather than on nationality or the parent country nationality status. So the question for all of us is that why should firms be interested in uh, international assignments? So there are at least five objectives which have been identified in the literature. Firms would like to maintain their own control, uh, their own style of uh, operation and management. And uh, uh, in order to ensure uh, that superior financial results are delivered. So that is reason number one. The second objective of international trans assignment could be transfer of knowledge and organizational development. Often it is two way, but in some ethnocentric uh, context, it could be one way. The third objective is to fill positions with, uh, with the staff members, which the organization perceives to be qualified and competent. Fourth is to develop or inculcate greater corporate loyalty in order to, in a way, give exposure uh, and valuable experience to uh, staff members for international assignments. And the final, or fifth and the final objective is to facilitate management development by increasing or enhan enhancing uh, global, once again, experience of the staff and ensuring that their career remains on the advancement path. So with uh, this explanation of international assignments and its objectives, now we can define an international assignee who is uh, somebody uh, uh, which is an employee who has been assigned by his or her employer to work in a country other than his or her own home country for a fixed period of time. It can be short term, it can be long term, it can be project based. So the term expatriate is often used when describing and discussing international assignments. Now there are also contextual, uh, contextual I would say considerations. So for example, in the UAE and other Gulf countries, usually, if not always, the term expatriate is used uh, for usually for, uh, for managers or senior level positions, which are usually filled by uh, people of European or North American or Australian backgrounds. Whereas for non-managerial jobs or low profile jobs, the term which is used in the Persian Gulf countries is migrant workers. Okay, let's go to the types of international uh, assignees. Organizations, whether they are MNCs or MNEs or TNCs, they can deploy staff on international assignments uh, from three groups. And basically it reflects their respective EPG orientation which would be either they would be nominating or they would have a tendency to nominate parent country nationals, TCNs or, a, or a host country nationals, which would be HCNs, or it could be third party nationals, those who are neither from the host country or from the parent countries. So, so these could be three orientations of organizations when it comes to the selection of international assignees. But then there is a whole process of recruitment and selection of expatriates. So for example, there are uh, organizations, of course, they have to take into account the strategic goals of expatriation. What exactly is something which they are hoping to achieve uh, by the expatriate assignment? Uh, what exactly is the technical competence or skills needed for that specific job? What would be the personal attributes of the person? their social abilities uh, required for the job, uh, the nature of the assignment and the expatriate's ability to cope with different culture uh, and their family situation. And then of course, legal considerations uh, would have to be taken into account. Uh, are there any legal enablers or disablers? 
And then there would be other factors such as the industrial context and the host country and the parent country's economic situation, etc. So in terms of the specific competencies of expatriates, uh, usually expatriates or international assignees, they are expected to have a number of competencies. So the first thing is their relational abilities, their, ab their social abilities, that do they have the capacity to, for example, uh, understand and embrace uh, uh, different uh, uh, networks of people, different industry and social context, their cultural sensitivity and cultural intelligence, especially when there is a significant difference uh, between the home country and the host country. So, for example, if somebody is being sent as an expatriate from the UK to the US, then we can assume that the uh, cultural uh, difference would not be uh, so much significant as it would be, for example, if somebody would be sent from, uh, from the UK to Saudi Arabia or India, where we can understand that cultural difference uh, due to a number of reasons would be immense. And then also the expatriate's ability or willingness to deal with a different language, uh, not only at the workplace, but also in their everyday life outside the workplace. Uh, van der Zee and Van Udenhoven, uh, in their research, they have identified five personality traits uh, for success in an intercultural context. Uh, again, we, they talk about cultural empathy or cultural intelligence, open-mindedness, uh, social initiative, which corresponds to relational abilities, emotional stability or emotional intelligence. Uh, flexibility. So together these five, six or seven uh, competencies are, are traits. They can help uh, an expatriate early adjustment and uh, they can serve as a pathway to success for their assignment or work uh, in the host country. So let's move towards the more uh, psychological side of the contract, uh, the psychological contract between the expatriate and the organization. So psychological contract is an uh, unwritten set of expectations which are held by individual employees and specify what individuals or the organization expect uh, to give to and receive from each other in the course of their employment relationship. So managers who are overseeing international assignments, uh, they need to ensure that uh, the organization's HRM policies and practices, they are uh, able to meet the psychological uh, expectations of an expatriate. So some psychological expectations, which are not necessarily written, uh, uh, could be, for example, uh, would, they be, uh, would they be treated with care and compassion if something goes wrong in terms of their own adjustment in the host country or what kind of uh, support would be made available to them if they are facing certain issues in terms of language or in terms of law or in terms of networking uh, with, with, with the host country industry or employees. Uh, and, and what kind of, for example, opportunities would be available for them uh, when towards the end of their project or towards the end of their assignment, when they are brought back to the parent country. So these are some of the elements which may be considered in the psychological contract. So move, from a more structured perspective, we can also look at different phases of international assignment. Usually an international assignment or expatriate assignment would incorporate or would include uh, these three phases or stages. The first would be, of course, pre-departure, which would include the recruitment and selection of the uh, person with the right skill set, uh, uh, their briefing and training or sensitizing. Then the actual assignment, which would involve uh, relocation, adjustment, uh, performance of the requisite task, dealing with issues of culture, cultural variance, personal stress, and family anxieties, and so on and so forth. And then the third 
stage which is often ignored but must not be ignored is the post assignment which may include or which does include uh, repatriation transfers the issues of reverse cultural reverse culture shock and the psychological contract or the fulfill, fulfillment of the expected uh, psychological uh, contract so how organizations can ensure a successful international assignee experience is surely uh, through a number of steps first would be the full analysis of the job description and, jo and job specification uh, in particular the job requirements the technical requirements what would be the managerial duties what exactly would be the t types of interaction within and outside the organization that the uh, expatriate incumbent of the job uh, would be expected to take care of an analysis of the country assignment uh, the country of assignment including uh, culture, religion, ethnic practices, local sensitivities, uh, standards of living, uh, physical environment, uh, uh, availability or provision of education, and basic necessities of life. And candidate is evaluated on the basis of specific criteria, for example, their suitability for the job, their flexibility and adapt adaptability to cultural variances, whether they have a desire at all for foreign assignments, uh, what exactly is their type of personality, uh, are they willing to experience new things, their uh, career status and their ambitions uh, for the future and their language skills. Cross-cultural training surely would be one of the uh, important considerations. Uh, it is also known as intercultural training. Zamber uh, identifies two levels of uh, uh, cross-cultural training. One would be cognitive, uh, which uh, uh, gives information about the host country's cultural values and political and economic situation. And the other would be more experiential, where participants through some kind of simulation or uh, some kind of short-term job, on-job experience, they learn how to behave in the foreign culture uh, or some kind of role play. So Chien says that uh, most intercultural training programs employ um, at least uh, one of six different approaches. So training is based on information or knowledge, uh, attribution training is offered, cultural awareness uh, and sensitivity are inculcated cognitive or behavior modification or adjustment is developed or sensitized experiential learning through simulation uh, or, or maybe short-term assignments and actual interaction with those people who have been, for example, the past expatriates or are the current expatriates and such interaction could be uh, uh, in terms of face-to-face -face meetings or visits or short-term short visits or it could be through, for example, uh, video link conversations, detailed conversations, or participation in overseas meetings via video link. Now, the repatriation of international assignees, as I said, it's a much ignored topic, but it's an important topic. It's a process concerning the return of an expatriate from an international assignment. So Peng and Mayer, in 2011, they published their research and they identified two key challenges which are related to uh, repatriation. Uh, one is the professional re-entry. So for example, uh, those people who have served, uh, a foreign served at a foreign assignment for a number of years, when they come back, would they have the opportunity to come back at least at the same level or the higher level or would they be uh, would they not have that opportunity or would that would they be demoted because uh, they, they, there is not a appropriate opportunity available in the parent country or in the, uh, the in the organization in the parent country so that is one consideration and the other is uh, their own private life that how would their pri private life for example now uh, uh, change. Uh, so put, put it this way, for example, those uh, expatriates, particularly uh, the, the British and the American expatriates who brought their families and who served uh, in Persian Gulf countries or South Asian countries for five years or ten years, when their families and they, when they go back to the US or the UK or to Australia, 
then perhaps one kind of challenge which they face is that that now they would not have the luxury of the uh, of the uh, paid uh, uh, chauffeurs or drivers or the house help or maids which were available for them uh, in countries uh, such as UAE or Lebanon or India so so this could then also have an effect on their own private life. Uh, uh, similar, similarly, uh, the education system to which their children were exposed to, whether that education system or qualification stream, whether that is uh, accepted or equally valued and recognized uh, in the parent country. Surely there would be elements of reverse cultural, uh, reverse cultural shock. So people's attitudes or uh, 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 communities are national ethical practices, uh, they, they vary. So for example, many countries um, in Asia and Africa, they happen to be more collectivistic in their orientation to uh, work and society, whereas many countries um, in, in the West, they happen to be more individualistic. So would it then pose some kind of opportunity or challenge to the international returning international assignee is something which may be looked into. And dissatisfaction with repatriation, surely it can result in turnover. So that may once again uh, have to be considered because there is also a business case. In terms of critical reflections on uh, international assignments and expatriation, while it is a fact that global career is being acknowledged uh, as a valuable uh, form of capital or symbolic capital that can help individuals uh, advance in their careers and establish their own credentials internationally. But we also have to understand that whereas international assignments and expatriation they are often portrayed as glamorous and at times uh, 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 financially viable opportunities for young and ambitious employees. Such assignments also have uh, uh, their own constraints, anxieties, uh, boundaries and limitations. So th those have to be kept into account. So notwithstanding the multitude of motivations, uh, options, limitations and restrictions, the staffing methods for international assignments, they should focus on competencies and international competencies, uh, cross-cultural sensitivity, and the training aspects of international assignment. Towards the end of this chapter, uh, you may wish to study this specific case. Uh, it's a very interesting case which talks about Chinese experts uh, in India. So th these are three questions which you may wish to uh, reflect on when you read the case. The first is, to identify the key differences facing uh, difficulties facing Chinese ex expatriates in India. And the second question has two parts. What can MNCs do to address the challenges facing Chinese expats in India? And what can the host country do? So for, what can, for example, the Indian government and society do to address the challenges facing Chinese expatriates in India? And the third question also has two parts. What factors should Chinese MNCs consider in recruiting and selecting or uh, training managers and other employees for international assignments in India, Pakistan, UK or any other country? So I hope that you found uh, uh, this lecture on international assignments and expatriation uh, useful. And I thank you for your patient uh, hearing.